9. The interim chairmanship of the English department, which Gordon Finch had assumed after the death of Archer Sloan, was renewed year after year, until all the members of the department grew used to a casual anarchy, in which somehow classes got scheduled and taught, in which new appointments to the staff were made, in which the trivial departmental details somehow got taken care of, and in which year somehow succeeded year. It was generally understood that a permanent chairman would be appointed as soon as it became possible to make Finch the Dean of Arts and Sciences, a position that he held, in fact, if not in office. Josiah Claremont threatened never to die, though he was seldom seen any longer wandering through the halls. The members of the department went their ways, taught the classes they had taught the year before, and visited one another's offices in the hours between classes. They met together formally only at the beginning of each semester, when Gordon Finch called a perfunctory departmental meeting, and on those occasions, when the dean of the graduate college sent them memos requesting that they give oral and thesis examinations to graduate students who were nearing completion of their work. Such examinations took up an increasing amount of Stoner's time. To his surprise, he began to enjoy a modest popularity as a teacher. He had to turn away students who wanted to get into his graduate seminar on the Latin tradition and Renaissance literature, and his undergraduate survey classes were always filled. Several graduate students asked him to direct their theses, and several more asked him to be on their thesis committees. In the fall of 1931, the seminar was nearly filled even before registration. Many students had made arrangements with Stoner at the end of the preceding year or during the summer. A week after the semester started, and after the seminar had held one meeting, a student came to Stoner's office and asked to be let in the class. Stoner was at his desk with a list of the seminar students before him. He was attempting to decide upon seminar tasks for them, and it was particularly difficult since many were new to him. It was a September afternoon, and he had the window next to his desk open. The front of the great building lay in shadow, so that the green lawn before it showed the precise shape of the building with its semicircular dome and irregular roofline darkening the green and creeping imperceptibly outward over the campus and beyond. A cool breeze flowed through the window, bringing the crisp redolence of fall. A knock came. He turned to his open doorway and said, Come in. A figure shuffled out of the darkness of the hall into the light of the room. Stoner blinked sleepily against the dimness, recognizing a student whom he had noticed in the halls, but did not know. The young man's left arm hung stiffly at his side, and his left foot dragged as he walked. His face was pale and round, his horn-rimmed eyeglasses were round, and his black thin hair was parted precisely on the side and lay close to the round skull. Dr. Stoner, he asked. His voice was reedy and clipped, and he spoke distinctly. Yes, Stoner said. Well, won't you have a chair? The young man lowered himself into the straight wooden chair beside Stoner's desk. His leg was extended in a straight line, and his left hand, which was permanently twisted into a half-closed fist, rested upon it. He smiled, bobbed his head, and said with a curious air of self-depreciation, You may not know me, sir. I am Charles Walker. I am a second-year PhD candidate. I assist Dr. Lomax. Yes, Mr. Walker, Stoner said. What can I do for you? Well... I'm here to ask a favour, sir. Walker smiled again. I know your seminar is filled, but I want very much to get in it. He paused and said pointedly, Dr. Lomax suggested that I talk to you. I see, Stoner said. What's your speciality, Mr. Walker? The Romantic Poets, Walker said. Dr. Lomax will be the director of my dissertation. Stoner nodded. How far along are you in your coursework? I hope to finish within two years, Walker said. Well, that makes it easier, Stoner said. I offer the seminar every year. It's really so full now that it's hardly a seminar any longer, and one more person would just about finish the job. Why can't you wait until next year if you really want the course? Walker's eyes shifted away from him. Well, frankly, he said, and flashed his smile again. I'm the victim of a misunderstanding. All my own fault, of course. I didn't realize that each PhD student has to have at least four graduate seminars to get his degree, and I didn't take any at all last year. And as you know, they don't allow you to take more than one each semester. So if I'm to graduate in two years, I have to have one this semester. Stone aside, I see. So you don't really have a very special interest in the influence of the Latin tradition? 
Oh, indeed I do, sir. In indeed I do. It will be most helpful in my dissertation. Mr. Walker, you should know this is a rather specialized class, and I don't encourage people to enter it unless they have a particular interest. Yes, sir, Walker said. I assure you that I do have a particular interest. Stoner nodded. How is your Latin? Walker bobbed his head. Oh, it's fine, sir. I haven't taken my Latin exam yet, but I read it very well. Do you have French or German? Oh, yes, sir. Again, I haven't taken the exams yet. I thought I'd get them all out of the way at the same time, at the end of this year. But I read them both very well. Walker paused, then added, Dr. Lomax said he thought I would surely be able to do the work in the seminar. Stoner sighed. Very well, he said. Much of the reading will be in Latin, a little in French and German, though you might be able to get by without those. I'll give you a reading list, and we'll talk about your seminar topic next Wednesday afternoon. Walker thanked him effusively, and arose from his chair with some difficulty. I'll get right on to the reading, he said. I'm sure you won't regret letting me in your class, sir. Stoner looked at him with faint surprise. The question had not occurred to me, Mr. Walker, he said dryly. I'll see you on Wednesday. The seminar was held in a small basement room in the south wing of Jesse Hall. A dank but not unpleasant odour seeped from the cement walls, and feet shuffled in hollow whispers upon the bare cement floor. A single light hung from the ceiling in the centre of the room and shone downward, so that those seated at desktop chairs in the centre of the room rested in a splash of brightness. But the walls were a dim grey, and the corners were almost black, as if the smooth unpainted cement stuck in the light that streamed from the ceiling. On that second Wednesday of the seminar, William Stoner came into the room a few minutes late. He spoke to the students and began to arrange his books and papers on the small stained oak desk that stood squatly before the centre of a blackboard wall. He glanced at the small group scattered about the room. Some of them he knew. Two of the men were PhD candidates whose work he was directing. Four others were MA students in the department who had done undergraduate work with him. Of the remaining students, three were candidates for advanced degrees in modern language. One was a philosophy student doing his dissertation on the scholastics. One was a woman of advanced middle age, a high school teacher trying to get an M.A. during her sabbatical. And the last was a dark-haired young woman, a new instructor in the department, who had taken a job for two years while she completed a dissertation she had begun after finishing her coursework at an Eastern University. She had asked Stoner if she might audit the seminar, and he had agreed that she might. Charles Walker was not among the group. Stoner waited a few moments more, shuffling his papers. Then he cleared his throat and began the class. During our first meeting, we discussed the scope of this seminar, and we decided that we should limit our study of the medieval Latin tradition to the first three of the seven liberal arts, that is, to grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. He paused and watched the faces, tentative, curious, and mask-like. Focus upon him and what he said. Such a limiting may seem foolishly rigorous to some of you, but I have no doubt that we shall find enough to keep us occupied, even if we trace only superficially the course of the trivium upward into the 16th century. It is important that we realize that these arts of rhetoric, grammar, and dialectic meant something to a late medieval and early Renaissance man that we today can only dimly sense without an exercise of the historical imagination. To such a scholar, the art of grammar, for example, was not merely a mechanical disposition of the parts of speech. From late Hellenistic times through the Middle Ages, the study and practice of grammar included not only the skill of letters mentioned by Plato and Aristotle, it included also, and this became very important, a study of poetry and its technical felicities, an exegesis of poetry both in form and substance, and nicety of style, insofar as that can be distinguished from rhetoric. He felt himself warming to his subject, and he was aware that several of the students had leaned forward and had stopped taking notes. He continued, Moreover, if we in the twentieth century are asked which of these three arts is the most important, we might choose dialectic or rhetoric, but we would be most unlikely to choose grammar. Yet the Roman and medieval scholar and poet would almost certainly consider grammar the most significant. We must remember... A loud noise interrupted him. The door had opened and Charles Walker entered the room. As he closed the door, the books he carried under his crippled arm slipped and crashed to the floor. He bent awkwardly, his bad leg extended behind him, and slowly gathered his books and papers. Then he drew himself erect and shuffled across the room, the scrape of his foot across the bare cement raising a loud and grating hiss that sounded sibilantly hollow in the room. 
he found a chair in the front row and sat down. After Walker had settled himself and got his papers and books in order around his desk chair, Stoner continued. We must remember that the medieval conception of grammar was even more general than the late Hellenistic or Roman. Not only did it include the science of correct speech and the art of exegesis, it included as well the modern conceptions of analogy, etymology, methods of presentation, construction, the condition of poetic license, and the exceptions to that condition, and even metaphorical language or figures of speech. As he continued, elaborating upon the categories of grammar he had named, Stoner's eyes flitted over the class. He realized that he had lost them during Walker's entrance, and knew that it would be some time before he could once more persuade them out of themselves. Again and again his glance fell curiously upon Walker, who, after having taken notes furiously for a few moments, gradually let his pencil rest on his notebook, while he gazed at Stoner with a puzzled frown. Finally, Walker's hand shot up. Stoner finished the sentence he had begun, and nodded to him. Sir, Walker said, pardon me, but I don't understand. What can... He paused and let his mouth curl around the word. Grammar have to do with poetry. Fundamentally, I mean. Real poetry. Stoner said gently, as I was explaining before you came in, Mr. Walker, the term grammar, to both the Roman and medieval rhetoricians, was a great deal more comprehensive than it is today. To them it meant... He paused, realizing that he was about to repeat the early part of his lecture. He sensed the students stirring restlessly. I think this relationship will become clearer to you as we go on, as we see the extent to which the poets and dramatists, even of the Middle and Late Renaissance, were indebted to the Latin rhetoricians. All of them, sir. Walker smiled and leaned back in his chair. Wasn't it Samuel Johnson who said of Shakespeare himself that he had little Latin and less Greek? As the repressed laughter stirred in the room, Stoner felt a kind of pity come over him. You mean Ben Johnson, of course. Walker took off his glasses and polished them, blinking helplessly. Of course, he said, a slip of the tongue. Though Walker interrupted him several times, Stoner managed to get through his lecture without serious difficulty, and he was able to make assignments for the first reports. He let the seminar out nearly half an hour early, and hurried away from the classroom when he saw Walker shuffling toward him with a fixed grin on his face. He clattered up the wooden stairs from the basement, and took two at a time the smooth marble stairs that led to the second floor. He had the curious feeling that Walker was doggedly shuffling behind him, trying to overtake him in his flight. A hasty wash of shame and guilt came over him. On the third floor he went directly to Lomax's office. Lomax was in conference with a student. Stoner stuck his head in the door and said, Holly, can I see you for a minute after you're through? Lomax waved genially. Come on in. We're just breaking up. Stoner came in and pretended to examine the rows of books in their cases as Lomax and the student said their last words. When the student left, Stoner sat in the chair that he had vacated. Lomax looked at him inquiringly. It's about a student, Stoner said. Charles Walker. He said you sent him around to me. Lomax placed the tips of his fingers together, and contemplated them as he nodded. Yes, I believe I did suggest that you might profit from your seminar. What is it? In the Latin tradition. Can you tell me something about him? Lomax looked up from his hands and gazed at the ceiling, his lower lip thrust out judiciously. A good student. A superior student, I might say. He is doing his dissertation on Shelley and the Hellenistic ideal. It promises to be brilliant, really brilliant. It will not be what some would call, he hesitated delicately over the word, sound, but it is most imaginative. Did you have a particular reason for asking? Yes, Stoner said. He behaved rather foolishly in the seminar today. I was just wondering if I should attach any special significance to it. Lomax's early geniality had disappeared, and the more familiar mask of irony had slipped over him. Ah, yes, he said with a frosty smile. The gaucherie and foolishness of the young. Walker is, for reasons you may understand, rather awkwardly shy, and therefore at times defensive, and rather too assertive. As do we all, he has his problems, but his scholarly and critical abilities are not, I hope, to be judged in the light of his rather understandable psychic disturbances. 
He looked directly at Stoner, and said with cheerful malevolence, As you may have noticed, he is a cripple. It may be that, Stoner said thoughtfully. He sighed and got up from the chair. I suppose it's really too soon for me to be concerned. I just wanted to check with you. Suddenly Lomax's voice was tight and near trembling with suppressed anger. You will find him to be a superior student, I assure you. You will find him to be an excellent student. Stoner looked at him for a moment, frowning perplexedly. Then he nodded and went out of the room. The seminar met weekly. For the first several meetings, Walker interrupted the class with questions and comments that were so bewilderingly far off the mark that Stoner was at a loss as to how to meet them. Soon Walker's questions and statements were greeted with laughter, or pointedly disregarded by the students themselves. And after a few weeks he spoke not at all, but sat with a stony indignation and an air of outraged integrity as the seminar surged around him. It would, Stoner thought, have been amusing had there not been something so naked in Walker's outrage and resentment. But despite Walker, it was a successful seminar, one of the best classes Stoner had ever taught. Almost from the first, the implications of the subject caught the students, and they all had the sense of discovery that comes when one feels that the subject at hand lies at the center of a much larger subject, and when one feels intensely that a pursuit of the subject is likely to lead, where one does not know. The seminar organized itself, and the students so involved themselves that Stoner himself became simply one of them, searching as diligently as they. Even the auditor, the young instructor who was stopping over at Columbia while finishing her dissertation, asked if she might report on a seminar topic. She thought that she had come upon something that might be of value to the others. Her name was Catherine Driscoll, and she was in her late twenties. Stoner had never really noticed her until she talked to him after class about the report and asked him if he would be willing to read her dissertation when she got it finished. He told her that he welcomed the report and that he would be glad to read her dissertation. The seminar reports were scheduled for the second half of the semester. After the Christmas vacation, Walker's report on Hellenism and the medieval Latin tradition was due early in the term, but he kept delaying it, explaining to Stoner his difficulty in obtaining books he needed which were not available in the university library. It had been understood that Miss Driscoll, being an auditor, would give her report after the credit students had given theirs. But on the last day Stoner had allowed for the seminar reports, two weeks before the end of the semester, Walker again begged that he be allowed one more week. He had been ill, his eyes had been troubling him, and a crucial book had not arrived from interlibrary loan. So Miss Driscoll gave her paper on the day vacated by Walker's defection. Her paper was entitled Donatus and Renaissance Tragedy. Her concentration was upon Shakespeare's use of the Donatan tradition, a tradition that had persisted in the grammars and handbooks of the Middle Ages. A few moments after she began, Stoner knew that the paper would be good, and he listened with an excitement that he had not felt for a long time. After she had finished the paper, and the class had discussed it, he detained her for a few moments while the other students went out of the room. Miss Driscoll, I just wanted to say... He paused, and for an instant a wave of awkwardness and self-consciousness came over him. She was looking at him inquiringly, with large, dark eyes. Her face was very white against the severe black frame of her hair, drawn tight and caught in a small bun at the back. He continued, I just want to say that your paper was the best discussion I know of the subject, and I'm grateful that you volunteered to give it. She did not reply. Her expression did not change. But Stoner thought for a moment that she was angry. Something fierce glinted behind her eyes. Then she blushed furiously and ducked her head, whether in anger or acknowledgement Stoner did not know, and hurried away from him. Stoner walked slowly out of the room, disquieted and puzzled, fearful that in his clumsiness he might somehow have offended her. He had warned Walker as gently as he could that it would be necessary for him to deliver his paper the next Wednesday if he was to receive credit for the course. As he half expected, Walker became coldly and respectfully angry at the warning, repeated the various conditions and difficulties that had delayed him, and assured Stoner that there was no need to worry, that his paper was nearly completed. On that last Wednesday, Stoner was delayed several minutes in his office by a desperate undergraduate who wished to be assured that he would receive a C in the sophomore survey course so that he would not be kicked out of his fraternity. 
Stoner hurried downstairs and entered the basement seminar room a little out of breath. He found Charles Walker seated at his desk, looking imperiously and somberly at the small group of students. It was apparent that he was engaged in some private fantasy. He turned to Stoner and gazed at him haughtily, as if he were a professor putting down a rowdy freshman. Then Walker's expression broke, and he said, We were just about to start without you. He paused at the last minute, let a smile through his lips, bobbed his head, and added, so that Stoner would know a joke was being made, Sir. Stoner looked at him for a moment and then turned to the class. I'm sorry I'm late. As you know, Mr. Walker is to deliver his seminar paper today upon the topic of Hellenism and the medieval Latin tradition. And he found a seat in the first row, next to Catherine Driscoll. Charles Walker fiddled for a moment with the sheaf of papers on the desk before him and allowed the remoteness to creep back into his face. He tapped the forefinger of his right hand on his manuscript and looked toward the corner of the room, away from where Stoner and Catherine Driscoll sat, as if he were waiting for something. Then, glancing every now and then at the sheaf of papers on the desk, he began. Confronted as we are by the mystery of literature, and by its inenarrable power, we are behooved to discover the source of the power and mystery. And yet, finally, what can avail? The work of literature throws before us a profound veil which we cannot plumb, and we are but votaries before it, helpless in its sway. Who would have the temerity to lift that veil aside, to discover the undiscoverable, to reach the unreachable? The strongest of us are but the puniest weaklings, are but tinkling cymbals and sounding brass before the eternal mystery. His voice rose and fell, his right hand went out with its fingers curled supplicatingly upward, and his body swayed to the rhythm of his words. His eyes rolled slightly upward, as if he were making an invocation. There was something grotesquely familiar in what he said and did, and suddenly Stoner knew what it was. This was Hollis Lomax, or rather a broad caricature of him, which came unsuspected from the caricature, a gesture not of contempt or dislike, but of respect and love. Walker's voice dropped to a conversational level, and he addressed the back wall of the room in a tone that was calm and equable with reason. Recently we have heard a paper that, to the mind of academe, must be accounted most excellent. These remarks that follow are remarks that are not personal. I wish to exemplify a point. We have heard in this paper an account that purports to be an explanation of the mystery and soaring lyricism of Shakespeare's art. Well, I say to you, and he thrust a forefinger at his audience as if he would impale them, I say to you, it is not true. He leaned back in his chair and consulted the papers on the desk. We are asked to believe that one Donatus, an obscure Roman grammarian of the 4th century AD, we are asked to believe that such a man, a pedant, had sufficient power to determine the work of one of the greatest geniuses in all of the history of art. May we not suspect, on the face of it, such a theory? Must we not suspect it? Anger, simple and dull, rose within Stoner, overwhelming the complexity of feeling he had had at the beginning of the paper. His immediate impulse was to rise, to cut short the farce that was developing. He knew that if he did not stop Walker at once, he would have to let him go on for as long as he wanted to talk. His head turned slightly so that he could see Catherine Driscoll's face. It was serene and without any expression, save one of polite and detached interest. The dark eyes regarded Walker with an unconcern that was like boredom. Covertly, Stoner looked at her for several moments. He found himself wondering what she was feeling and what she wished him to do. When he finally shifted his gaze away from her, he had to realize that his decision was made. He had waited too long to interrupt, and Walker was rushing impetuously through what he had to say. The monumental edifice that is Renaissance literature, that edifice which is the cornerstone of the great poetry of the 19th century, the question of proof endemic to the dull course of scholarship as distinguished from criticism is also sadly at lack. What proof is offered that Shakespeare even read this obscure Roman grammarian? We must remember it was Ben Jonson, he hesitated for a brief moment. It was Ben Jonson himself, Shakespeare's friend and contemporary, who said he had little Latin and less Greek. And certainly Jonson, who idolized Shakespeare, this side of idolatry, did not impute to his great friend any lack. On the contrary, he wished to suggest, as do I, 
that the soaring lyricism of Shakespeare was not attributable to the burning of the midnight oil, but to a genius natural and supreme to rule and mundane law. Unlike lesser poets, Shakespeare was not born to blush unseen and waste his sweetness on the desert air. Partaking of that mysterious source to whence all poets go for their sustenance, what need had the immortal bard of such stultifying rules as are to be found in a mere grammar? What would Donatus be to him, even if he had read him? Genius, unique, and a law unto itself, needs not the support of such a tradition as has been described to us, whether it be generically Latin, or Donatan, or whatever. Genius, soaring and free, must... After he became used to his anger, Stoner found a reluctant and perverse admiration stealing over him. However florid and imprecise, the man's powers of rhetoric and invention were dismayingly impressive, and however grotesque, his presence was real. There was something cold and calculating and watchful in his eyes, something needlessly reckless and yet desperately cautious. Stoner became aware that he was in the presence of a bluff so colossal and bold that he had no ready means of dealing with it. For it was clear even to the most inattentive students in the class that Walker was engaged in a performance that was entirely impromptu. Stoner doubted that he had had any very clear idea of what he was going to say until he had sat at the desk before the class and looked at the students in his cold, imperious way. It became clear that the sheaf of papers on the desk before him was only a sheaf of papers. As he became heated, he did not even glance at them in pretense, and toward the end of his talk, in his excitement and urgency, he shoved them away from him. He talked for nearly an hour. Toward the end, the other students in the seminar were glancing worriedly at one another, almost as if they were in some danger, as if they were contemplating escape. They carefully avoided looking at either Stoner or the young woman who sat impassively beside him. Abruptly, as if sensing the unrest, Walker brought his talk to a close, leaned back in the chair behind the desk, and smiled triumphantly. The moment Walker stopped talking, Stoner got to his feet and dismissed the class, Though he did not realize it at the time, he did so out of a vague consideration for Walker, so that none of them might have the chance to discuss what he had said. Then Stoner went to the desk where Walker remained, and asked him if he would stay for a few moments. As if his mind was somewhere else, Walker nodded distantly. Stoner then turned and followed a few straggling students out of the room into the hall. He saw Catherine Driscoll starting away, walking alone down the hall. He called her name and when she stopped, he walked up and stood in front of her. And as he spoke to her, he felt again the awkwardness that had come over him when, last week, he had complimented her on her paper. A Miss Driscoll, I, I'm sorry, it was really most unfair. I feel that somehow I am responsible. Perhaps I should have stopped it. Still, she did not reply, nor did any expression come on her face. She looked up at him as she had looked across the room at Walker. Anyhow, he continued, still more awkwardly, I'm sorry he attacked you. And then she smiled. It was a slow smile that started in her eyes and pulled at her lips until her face was wreathed in radiant, secret, and intimate delight. Stoner almost pulled back from the sudden and involuntary warmth. Oh, it wasn't me, she said, a tiny tremor of suppressed laughter giving timbre to her low voice. It wasn't me at all. It was you he was attacking. I was hardly even involved. Stoner felt lifted from him, a burden of regret and worry that he had not known he carried. His relief was almost physical, and he felt light on his feet and a little giddy. He laughed. Of course, he said. Of course, that's true. The smile eased itself off her face, and she looked at him gravely for a moment more, then she bobbed her head, turned away from him, and walked swiftly down the hall. Her body was slim and straight, and she carried herself unobtrusively. Stoner stood looking down the hall for several moments after she disappeared. Then he sighed and went back into the room where Walker waited. Walker had not moved from the desk. He gazed at Stoner and smiled, upon his face an odd mixture of obsequiousness and arrogance. Stoner sat in the chair he had vacated a few minutes before and looked curiously at Walker. Yes, sir, Walker said. Do you have an explanation? Stoner asked quietly. 
A look of hurt surprise came upon Walker's round face. What do you mean, sir? Mr. Walker, please, Stoner said wearily. It has been a long day, and we're both tired. Do you have an explanation for your performance this afternoon? I'm sure, sir, I intended no offence. He removed his glasses and polished them rapidly. Again, Stoner was struck by the naked vulnerability of his face. I said my remarks were not intended personally. If feelings have been hurt, I shall be most happy to explain to the young lady. Mr. Walker, Stoner said, you know that isn't the point. Has the young lady been complaining to you? Walker asked. His fingers were trembling as he put his glasses back on. With them on, his face managed a frown of anger. Really, sir, the complaints of a student whose feelings have been hurt should not... Mr. Walker! Stoner heard his voice go a little out of control. He took a deep breath. This has nothing to do with the young lady, or with myself, or with anything except your performance, and I still await any explanation you have to offer. Then I'm afraid I don't understand at all, sir, unless... Unless what, Mr. Walker? Unless it is simply a matter of disagreement, Walker said. I realize that my ideas do not coincide with yours, but I've always thought that disagreement was healthy. I assume that you were big enough to... I will not allow you to evade the issue, Stoner said. His voice was cold and level. Now, what was the seminar topic assigned to you? You're angry, Walker said. Yes, I am angry. What was the seminar topic assigned to you? Walker became stiffly formal and polite. My topic was Hellenism and the medieval Latin tradition, sir. And when did you complete that paper, Mr. Walker? Two days ago. As I told you, it was nearly complete a couple of weeks ago, but a book I had to get through into library loan didn't come in until... Mr. Walker, if your paper was nearly finished two weeks ago, how could you have based it in its entirety upon Miss Driscoll's report, which was given only last week? I made a number of changes, sir, at the last minute. His voice became heavy with irony. I assumed that that was permissible, and I did depart from the text now and then. I noticed that other students did the same, and I thought the privilege would be allowed me also. Stoner fought down a near hysterical impulse to laugh. Mr. Walker, will you explain to me what your attack on Miss Driscoll's paper has to do with the survival of Hellenism in the medieval Latin tradition? I approach my subject indirectly, sir, Walker said. I thought we were allowed a certain latitude in developing our concepts. Stoner was silent for a moment. Then he said wearily, Mr. Walker, I dislike having to flunk a graduate student. Especially I dislike having to flunk one who simply has got in over his head. Sir, Walker said indignantly, but you're making it very difficult for me not to. Now, it seems to me that there are only a few alternatives. I can give you an incomplete in the course, with the understanding that you will do a satisfactory paper on the assigned topic within the next three weeks. But, sir, Walker said, I have already done my paper. If I agree to do another one, I'll be admitting... I will admit... All right, Stoner said. Then, if you will give me the manuscript from which you deviated this afternoon, I shall see if something can be salvaged. Sir, Walker cried... I would hesitate to let it out of my possession just now. The draft is very rough. With a grim and restless shame, Stoner continued, That's all right. I shall be able to find out what I want to know. Walker looked at him craftily. Tell me, sir, have you asked anyone else to hand his manuscript in to you? I have not, Stoner said. Then, Walker said triumphantly, almost happily, I must refuse also to hand my manuscript into you on principle, unless you require everyone else to hand theirs in. Stoner looked at him steadily for a moment. Very well, Mr. Walker. You have made your decision. That will be all. Walker said, What am I to understand then, sir? What may I expect from this course? Stoner laughed shortly. Mr. Walker, you amaze me. You will, of course, receive an F. Walker tried to make his round face long. With the patient bitterness of a martyr, he said, I see. Very well, sir. One must be prepared to suffer for one's beliefs. And for one's laziness and dishonesty and ignorance, Stoner said. Mr. Walker, it seems almost superfluous to say this, but I would most strongly advise you to re-examine your position here. I seriously question whether you have a place in a graduate program. 
For the first time, Walker's emotion appeared genuine. His anger gave him something that was close to dignity. Mr. Stoner, you're going too far. You can't mean that. I most certainly mean it, Stoner said. For a moment, Walker was quiet. He looked thoughtfully at Stoner. Then he said, I was willing to accept the grade you gave me, but you must realize that I cannot accept this. You are questioning my competence. Yes, Mr. Walker, Stoner said wearily. He raised himself from the chair. Now, if you will excuse me, he started for the door. But the sound of his shouted name halted him. He turned. Walker's face was a deep red. His skin was puffed so that the eyes behind their thick glasses were like tiny dots. Mr. Stoner, he shouted again. You have not heard the last of this. Believe me, you have not heard the last of this. Stoner looked at him dully, incuriously. He nodded distractedly, turned, and went out into the hall. His feet were heavy, and they dragged on the bare cement floor. He was drained of feeling, and he felt very old and tired.